This is Eric Strawn here again, teaching a little bit about how to wire up your race car or rat rod cheaply. Uh, it's been about four or five months since I posted the video on the basics of how to wire up your car. Uh, I decided to build a workshop, 30 by 40. Still in work, but getting closer, and it's caused me to take some time off from working on the cars. So I've got the Jaguar in here. And the first thing I had to do was vacuum it out. It took me about a half an hour to clean out all the leaves out of the car. If you're going to be working on a car, get it clean. Uh, if you're doing field, field work, you know, I understand. You know, you have to work on it when it's dirty. But if you're going to be doing something in a shop like this, clean it up. Get that mess out of there so that you can do what you need to do. I've got all the leaves out of the back, out of the front. Even clean them out of the doors. And uh, it's going to be a lot easier to work on when I'm not digging through leaves for lost parts. Now, when you're trying to wire up your car from scratch, the first thing you have to do with any major project is count your assets and your liabilities. Figure out where you have to have power to on the car and what you have to work with to get it there. Uh, some of this stuff I'm going to reuse, some of it I'm not. But I'm also talking about things like the firewall pass-through for power. You, I can use that to save some, some time and space on, on wire. I've got you know pass-through back here that I'm going to have to use. I've got one on the other side I could use and not going to because I'm going to run everything down this side. What are your assets as far as your fuel tank? Are, are, are you going to have to run a fuel cell? Or are you going to be able to use the factory tanks? You know, are you going to have to run power back here for, for the fuel pump? Things like that you want to sort out in your head before you start. You know, what do your rules say about where your shutoff switch has to be? I race in the 24 hours of lemons, and in that series, we're required to have the fuel cell or the fuel, you have to have the power shut off within reach of the driver but also within reach of track officials. And as you can see, putting it right here meets both those requirements. Some other race series require the, the, the switch to be reachable from either side of the car, which would make it a little more difficult. You probably put it in the center there or something. Um, you do want to have it within reach of the driver in case you're, you get bumped and the, the switch gets knocked off. Uh, even if you don't run the 24 hours of lemons. Uh, that is the best place to me to mount a switch. If I ever have to have it switch off from the other side, I'd basically just put another switch over there that the track officials could use. But then again, you run afoul of the driver not being able to reach it. Now, as far as battery position, for weight distribution, a lot of times you want your battery right there. If you're building a rat rod and you want it to be streetable, you may not put your battery there. You may put it under the hood. But I have a roll cage here to use as an asset to run my battery cables. And so I run the battery cables right up to this switch. And then I run it from here down, oh, no, across, and down to my distribution panels. So that is, that's sorted out. Now, as far as distribu distributing the power, what do you have? Do you have a junkyard fuse box? Or do you have one that you bought? Did you buy a, a full-on kit for wiring your car? So. I'm distributing main power to here and running a tap off of here to my fuse panel here that everything is going to, that, that, that distributes power to everything else. Um, for, for relays, I'm using a bunch of just regular car relays. I am going to rework this bracket at some point and I'll, I'll, I'll show how to do that. Uh, the bracket's wonderful except for the fact that half of them are pointed up, half of them are pointed down. And I'd really like the tops of the relays to be pointed up, that way it's a little more weatherproof. When it comes to power cutoff switches, buy a decent quality one. I had a decent quality one in here at first, and it sat for about a year, the car sat for about a year, and the switch went bad on me. So I bought another switch that was a Harbor Freight, and uh, it doesn't hold the amperage. After a couple times of having trouble starting the car, it was drawing a lot of amperage to the switch, and it actually melted. And that was when we were at the racetrack. Uh, a team captain sent somebody out, and they found this one real quick at racetrack prices. Not cheap. You want to you want to spend the money on the front end while you're preparing the car, and not have to do it at the racetrack. Uh, this one's holding up nicely. It's better quality than both the previous ones, I guess. Uh, the connectors were easier to get to when I had the Harbor Freight one on here, and you could see when you were working. But we've got this banner over it now and you can't really see what you're doing when you go to put this on so it's a little tricky. If you see in here there's two terminals 
that's for hooking up your alternator. Uh, it'll cut power to your alternator so you don't fry the, uh, the diodes whenever your, your engine spins down after you shut it off. Uh, this one, uh, we couldn't really fit the, the wires in there, and I'm using GM alternators that are a little more rugged, so uh, you know, I'm not going to worry about that too much. Uh, the main thing is the, the two big cables here for the battery uh, are switched off whenever you turn the key off. Now for the key itself, I've got this handy little cable here. You can buy these wedges, you can buy this cable, dirt cheap, get you one of these little swivel locks. And my key is right there, it's always within reach. I can flip that, turn power on, flip it off, and the key just stays right there no matter what. I've added this little pigtail on the end for hood pins. Whenever I take the hood pins out, I can just latch them onto here. And then, uh, you know, just make sure I, the, the hood pins were right there whenever you go turn power on. If you still have hood pins hanging, uh, you know not to turn power on, not to get back out on the track. By now you're saying, Eric, you're going to teach me how to do this cheaply. And all you've been doing is talking about planning and talking about best practices, how to lay stuff out. Well, here, I'll start getting to the cheap stuff now. For years and years, the secret has been to go to a pull-apart and get the battery cables out of a BMW 3 Series. Now, every time I go to pull-apart, I check the BMW 3 Series, and the battery cables are always robbed. Somebody else has gone in there before me and gotten them. A couple times I found some. Uh, usually there was something wrong with the car, doors locked, whatever. It was real pain to get to the cable. The cable was still there. For some reason or another, I had trouble pulling it. I have successfully gotten the cable once, and that's one of the cables that's in the Jaguar here. Uh, I had to splice it together with another cable to make a long enough run, but that's a whole other story. Sometimes you may have to get two or three cables if you were going to make a really long run of wire, and I'll show you how to do the, a proper splice if you're going to do that. But yesterday I was at Pull Apart getting parts for my son's car, and I spotted a BMW X5. I thought, you know, if they've got long battery cables in the, in the 3 Series, what's the X5 got? This is what the X5 has. It's got two nice battery cables in it. One, smaller gauge, big enough for a four-cylinder race car or, you know, something that doesn't have a whole lot of amperage draw. About three feet long, has good terminal ends, and it's got this nice Velcro felt scuff guard on it. The main cable goes from the back on up to the driver's side floorboard uh, firewall. Ten foot, six inches long, big, thick gauge wire. You can see it's got a lot of strands, so it's quality. You can run a big block off this pretty easy, but it's got the, the scuff cover on it. The BMW X5s are out there. There's a lot of them, and they're starting to hit the pull at your self yards. Don't pass them up. Look for this cable. All right, I said I was going to show you how to splice two cables together. Whenever you have two or three cables to make your entire run to your battery, normally you only want one splice in if you can help it. But, you know, it is what it is. If you have to go with more splices, then, you know, do what you got to do. But basically what you're going to do is take two of these ends like this and bolt them together. Now, I'm only using one piece of cable here to show you, but that's just as an example. And you're going to use F4 tape to tie these together. Uh, F4 tape is something I learned about in the military. Uh, supposedly it's called F4 tape because it's what held all the planes together during Vietnam. Uh, it holds a little bit of hydraulic pressure. It's insulating. Supposedly it holds up to 8,000 volts per layer. Uh, this is F4 tape. It's a self-sealing silicone tape. And the thing about this is when you stick it to itself, it does not come free. It uh, makes a really good bond but it kind of turns to goo over the years, and once you get it on there, it's not coming off. Now, it, it, you can cut it off, but it's not coming apart from itself. So basically, once you have your bolt there, you're going to wrap the silicone tape. And you can find this stuff on Amazon. If you haven't noticed, I tend to put links below the videos for where to find the stuff that I show. And I'll have a link for this stuff. There's a company that makes this under the name F4 Tape. I don't know if they're actually the company that supplies the military, but it is the, the same tape. Apparent, apparently, I haven't bought it yet from them. But you can see there's a little point there where it's kind of sharp. I'm going to put an extra layer there just to help give it some abrasion resistance. Okay, so I've got one layer there. It's thin in some places. I'm not really crazy about it. 
Uh, this stuff's not cheap, so I'm not going to do a, a second layer, but I would do a second layer over that, and that would make a permanent connection to the car. You're going to pass plenty of current through there. It's not going to hurt. And the insulation, pr insulating properties of the tape are such that so long as it doesn't rub through and poke through, it's going to insulate well enough for what you're doing. And if nothing else, if you have a Velcro rub strip, put it over that. And you have a full length of cable, fully protected. You can run you know, 20 feet of cable from your battery up to your disconnect switch, down to your starter. That's, that's how you get that long of a run with shorter battery cables, with the shorter cables you've robbed out of junkyard cars. For your negative cable, you can buy one of these, or if you're lucky enough, you can find one and pull apart. It shouldn't be too hard to find, but finding one in a big, thick gauge is kind of hard to pull apart. Luckily, they're only about 10 or $15 dollars from the parts store, but you know, poke around some of the bigger vehicles and see if you can find one of those. The ends are molded in place. You're not going to get corrosion up inside the wire. Uh, it's got the other end made on it already, so you don't have to make your own crimp connection and all that stuff like I've shown you earlier. Uh, it's ready to bolt on. Uh, the length, really all you need is to go from your negative post to a grounding point on the body. If you can, This one's about two feet long. If you can get one that's about a foot long and it reaches from your negative post to your, to your grounding point, that'll work great. Um, you really don't want a, a really long cable that you have to tuck out of the way and everything, but you do want it long enough that you can do maintenance. You can pull a battery in and out, whatever. You know, and you're not going to have to you know, fight with the, the cable to, to stretch it far enough to get it where you need it. When it comes to running power from your disconnect switch to the rest of the vehicle, there's a couple of ways of doing it. A lot of older cars and GM cars, the starter down here had a big thick wire going to it and everything, there was a smaller wire that came off the starter that ran to the rest of the electrical system. And that way the starter got full current whenever you crank turn the key. Um, there was less resistance in the direction of the starter than through the rest of the wiring system. So all the current would go to the starter. It was a way of making sure the starter motor had all the electricity needed to, to turn over. Uh, they, a lot of manufacturers have gotten away from that, even with things like this where there's a distribution flock. Uh, some newer cars on the battery terminal itself will have a place for the battery, for the, the power to come off and go to the rest of the car. Uh, you see that in a lot of Japanese cars. As you can see here on the BMW X5 cable, it's got a place, it's got a stud there that you can put your terminal down onto and bolt it down and you take your power right, right away from the battery to the rest of the car. I happen to prefer things that way. It makes it easier to, to, to get to. Uh, tapping all your electrical off the, the starter means if you have any issues with the battery cable, you've got to go down to the starter to get to it. And in some cars, that's kind of a pain in the butt. The final piece of power distribution is going to be your fuse block. You're going to run from wherever you have your main power a wire up to this fuse panel. And this is where you're going to have all your, your circuits in your car branch off, uh, like your lighting or your ignition and stuff. You can have fuses on here. And this is, this is for safety. You, you have to have fuses on your, your circuits, otherwise you have a, a good chance of burning your car to the ground if you have a short to ground somewhere. You can buy a fuse panel like this for about 10 bucks in a hardware store, or you can do what I did recently. I had uh, an order on Amazon and totaled up to 21 bucks, and... Uh, with $25 purchase, you get free shipping. Well, I found a fuse block similar to this other one for $6. And that was about what the shipping was going to be, so I basically got it for free. Uh, that said, you know, try telling your wife that and see how that, how that flies. You still spent money on parts, but um, it comes with this nice case. You know what? Don't care about the case. I'm going to mount this in my sunbeam like I have this fuse block in the Jagger knot. Uh, you see it's got some LEDs here. If your fuse pops, uh, your, uh, that breaks the circuit, and so all the, the current has to flow through your little light there. Your light comes on, and so that, that has little red lights that come on whenever, whenever you uh, lose a fuse. Um, 
But this is also where Made in China is going to bite you in the butt. These screws here are almost flush with the plastic case. So you do like I did, and you get some cardboard, and you cut it to fit and drill out some holes, and that way whenever you mount this in your chassis, you're not going to ground out to the, to the body and cause a fire and burn your car to the ground and wonder what happened because I put a fuse block on it. Now you could get a fuse block out of a junkyard car to use in place of one of these, but they don't come with handy dandy terminals like these. You're going to be cutting and splicing a lot of wires to get it to work. Uh, for the money, I'll add this onto an Amazon order to get me over 25 bucks and, and, and buy one of these any day of the week. Uh, you put little ring terminals on the end of your wires and just screw them down. It's, it's easy. And I'll show more of that whenever it comes time to, to wire up something.